Activate, Activate your voice. voice. Activate now. Live, Live from Portland, Portland, Maine. This is Activate Live. Woo! <laughs> Welcome to a special edition of Activate Live. I am Tanya Hutchins in Maine at the Maine Council of Machinists meeting in Portland. Now the theme is Let's Talk, Communication is Job One. A panel discussion took place today and we're going to talk to a few of the machinists here so they can tell you about themselves, their locals, and what they learned, and also introduce you to some of the issues important here in Maine. But we want you to join the conversation by letting us know if you work in Maine, and if so, where and what you do. We want to give props to all of our members and all of the workers here. First up is the president of the council, Don Billado. I hope I pronounced that correctly, of the Maine State Council of Machinists. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Now tell us how many machinists do we have in Maine? We have just over 4,000 machinists uh, in all trades. Now, speaking of all trades, it's very diverse. Where are some of the places that our members work? Well, we have Bath Ironworks in Bath, Maine. Uh, we build uh, military ships. Uh, we have the shipyard in, in uh, Kittery, uh, the Portsmouth Naval, Naval Shipyard in Kittery. Uh, we have paper mill workers from Woodland, Maine to uh, Skowhegan. Uh, it's pretty diverse. Uh, and we have municipal workers throughout the state. So and we have everybody, truck we, drivers. We everybody. have truck drivers, yes. Uh, we have tool and die makers in Clinton, Maine. Uh, so it's pretty well most of the state. Why is it so important for us to make sure that we are working together on a statewide level? Well, first of all, we have to elect the right politicians uh, to understand our issues. Uh, and whenever people work together, such as we do, the more strength we have, uh, better wages, better benefits, uh, and so on, retirement. Now tell us a little bit about where you started out and how you got involved in the union. I started out at Bath Iron Works in 1978. I got involved with the union because at that the time, at one time, uh, supervisors were, went rampant on, on certain people and at that time I was outspoken so I, I just couldn't sit down and watch uh, the way people were being handled. So I became a shop steward and I moved on up the ladder since then. Uh, that's, that's usually how it goes. You can't keep quiet when you see things happening around you, right? That's right. So I got active in the union and found my way at this level. And I'm part of the legislative branch for the machinist. And that's a very important part of the machinist union. When we have issues uh, with bills, that need to be passed. We go to Augusta, from Augusta to Washington, wherever needed to uh, help working people of, of any, every caliber. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you taking the time uh, during this meeting. Well, you're welcome. Okay, thank you. And we are hoping that all of you um, at home watching now will join the conversation and tell us a little bit about you know where you work, where you're located, especially if you are in Maine. So you can join us on Facebook or Twitter. Um, also on YouTube, there's a live chat button on there on YouTube as well, um, where you can take a look and, and talk with us or, and ask us any questions. Well, our next guest is a council vice president, Kevin Wadley. Did I say that correct, Kevin? Yes, you did. I did. Okay, so I'm actually going to hand you this as long as you promise me you'll hold it kind of close. All right. Okay, so tell us a little bit about how, where you started out and how you got involved with the union. I started at the shipyard at Bath Iron Works in 1988, um, just past my 30-year mark um, as a pipe fitter um, and worked as an apprentice. After that, I uh, became a planner in Local 7, um, and uh, I joined the union and become a steward, and uh, I'm on the grievance committee, the negotiating committee, and the legislative committee. Um, I had a real good interest in that and helping my fellow brothers and sisters, and so I joined the Maine State Council and became the vice president under Don 
um, about four years ago. So do you feel like you had a calling to this work? I really did. Um, I enjoy working with, with everybody and, and helping them, um, you know, especially being a steward, helping them out, get out of trouble or just um, I get a good uh, feeling helping people. Um, so that's good. Now there was a panel discussion today about um, labor and the media. What really stuck out for you with that panel discussion? Um, just that it's a common um, uh, around the country that we need to communicate more and get involved and uh, just you know tell government that you know we've we've had enough um, wages and benefits um, being decreased and that we need to uh, you know stick together and and uh, be united and and take on these 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 fights. Well, thank you so much, Kevin, thank for joining you. us. We appreciate it. Um, and we are on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, so join the conversation. Um, let us know what you think about what we've been discussing. And we are going to bring in our next guest, who is John Portella. And John has been working very hard on this Maine State Council of Machinists conference that's happening um, today. Um, we've had a full day of activities. Um, and one of the things I'd like to mention is we have these beautiful murals behind us. Um, and John, there's a lot of history behind these murals. Um, tell us a little bit about where the original murals are and what happened to them. Well, thank you, Tanya. The uh, murals represent uh, Maine's labor history. There are uh, uh, 11 panels uh, that tell various aspects, strikes, political activity. You'll see uh, Frances Perkins, the uh, first female Secretary Cabinet working for uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, the original panels were painted in 2007 and were first displayed at a Labor Day event here in Portland, Maine, and then were put on permanent display in the lobby of the Department of Labor here in Augusta, Maine. Uh, our current governor uh, received some anonymous complaints from uh, business people that uh, they were offensive. Uh, so he removed them, stored them somewhere where he would not disclose. A lawsuit was filed um, through the labor unions of Maine, and uh, it went to federal court. It was a First Amendment issue. And ultimately, the uh, labor unions prevailed, and there was a negotiated settlement so that the original panels, these are reproductions, the original panels are now on permanent display in the lobby of the uh, Maine State Museum in Augusta, Maine. So uh, uh, our labor history has created yet another chapter of history here for the workers of Maine, and we hope uh, is uh, instructive for all Maine citizens. And let's just go back for a minute. that. The business leaders thought at the time that they were offensive, which is kind of offensive to the workers of Maine. Well, allegedly. Right, right. But we, no one could find any evidence, and the uh, governor certainly did was not forthcoming with the uh, evidence that uh, precipitated the uh, the removal of the um, the uh, panels originally. So um, it was in the dark of night, undercover. Um, I think, you know, for business uh, owners and managers of uh, plants, their greatest resource is their workers. Uh, I don't know why anybody would be offended about the history of people working in the state of Maine. That's our story. We're going to continue to tell it. We talked a little bit earlier about the panel discussion that took place earlier about labor and the media um, and some of the coverage that we get and some of the coverage that we don't get. Um, why was it important for you to, to have that labor discussion with the media as part of the conference? Well, as you said earlier, Tanya, the uh, conference theme was let's talk, communication is job one. And so we need to understand how the media operates and what our relationship is with them. I was hoping that that would be both instructive and provocative so that the attendees at the, at the uh, conference would come away thinking about that whole idea of how we interact with the media. You know, we need to tell our story from our perspective and not have other people whose interests are significantly different than ours tell that story. So it was instructive to hear we had print, radio, and TV here. They all operate 
differently. Uh, but I thought it was fascinating to hear from them uh, why they do or don't cover labor. And for us to be able to understand that we need to be more proactive in getting our story out there. And our language, because according to you, you know, one of the things we like to say is right to work for less, but we're, we're using somebody else's language. What do you call it? I call it right to freeload. You know, the fact is that uh, most Americans think that they have rights. They're enshrined in the uh, Constitution, the, uh, uh, you know, the first ten amendments of the uh, Bill of Rights, uh, in the uh, Declaration of Independence, certain inalienable rights. Uh, so it's no surprise that uh, corporate America used that language and has been using it for the last 50 years. And it frames the debate in people's minds. We need to reframe the debate on our terms. The reality is it's deceptive advertising. It's designed to weaken unions, not to provide more rights for workers. So, Tanya, if I asked you if the golf club that you belong to would allow you to play while other members are paying for your dues and you're not, do you think they would? No. No. So let's call it what it really is. It's the right to freeload. That's right. Sounds like a good thing, but it isn't. That's right. Okay. Before you leave, just what does the Maine State Council of Machinists mean to you? It's an organization that can bring together the diverse aspects of our great uh, machinist union. We have lobstermen, we have railroad workers, we have mill workers, we have municipal public employees, shipyard workers, and oftentimes those members of those local unions are not interacting or communicating with each other. So this is an opportunity to uh, strengthen our collective voice and, and uh, really promote the interest of uh, our organization. Okay, thank you so much, John Portella. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. So we have been talking to officers with the Maine State Council of Machinists. The conference um, is happening today. You too can join the conversation and comment on what we're talking about, the history of labor history in Maine. We're going to bring in Carol Sanborn of IAM Local S89. Um, Carol was kind enough to uh, help me out as one of my assistants here. <laughs> but thanks for joining us, Carol. Thank you for having me. And tell us a little bit about how you became a union member, because I understand that you also helped with the organizing. Of course, no one organizes a unit alone. It's a you know, much larger collective effort. But I work for a labor law firm. I've been there over 34 years. So we've worked with every union in Maine, as, as well as non-union members. But we knew, uh, we knew members in every union. But we were not organized ourselves, and it, it took us longer than I care to admit to come to the conclusion that we deserved the same benefits of a union contract that our clients already had, and the machinist union was our largest client. So we, obviously, the machinist union is strong, and has a lot of resources, but it was also being our largest client gave us the most financial leverage against our firm in the negotiation process. So we essentially all came together because we wanted to have a disciplinary policy that applied the same to everyone. It wasn't about money at the beginning, and it was only through the process of um, negotiations when the information became available to us that we realized we did have um, some financial areas to work out but we all loved our jobs and we just wanted our workplace to be better and to have a voice at the table. Was that the key thing that got through to your other members of the bargaining unit? The one, th you know, our membership is diverse. We have Democrats, Republicans, Independents, people see things um, in a variety of ways, but the one thing we all agreed upon was that we wanted any discipline to be applied equally. So that was the primary um, factor that brought us together, and then the rest of it just followed. Any advice out there for people that are thinking about organizing? Be strong, you can do it, it takes time, but together 
we can accomplish great things. Okay. Thank you so much, Carol, for joining us. Thank you. We're just giving you an idea of the diverse members that we have here in Maine. Um, we've had our Maine State Council of Machinists conference going on all day. Um, so we want you to join in on the conversation and let us know what you think about what we've been talking about here in Maine. And our next guest that we're going to bring up is Rick Comfer, who is the District 4, the IAM District 4 Directing Business Rep. So he's been kind enough to, to sit down with us for a few minutes. Um, and Rick, yesterday, you, the whole District 4, help to organize a golf tournament here. Tell us a little bit about, um, you know, why Guide Dogs of America, which was, you know, benefiting from this golf tournament is so important. Well, again, Tony, thanks for having me. It's, it was a privilege and an honor to start uh, preparing for this tournament. This is a first really big Guide Dogs tournament uh, to benefit the, our Guide Dogs of America. And we took it as a challenge. Uh, we took it as, uh, we wanted to do our part as a district, as a group, uh, at be, and as a territory as well to be able to raise money for our pride and joys, and that's our puppies. Uh, we had a tournament yesterday. We had um, approximately 22 teams. Um, we heard a lot of aches and pains and moans and groans and swinging, <laughs> but yeah. uh, it, it was all best for, for the cause for the guide dogs. We raised uh, a tremendous amount of money through raffles, through uh, uh, gun raffles through uh, lobster raffles where we uh, had a raffle that District 4 would ship 10 pounds of lobster anywhere in the country either to you uh, your spouse your mom who's in Arizona your dad who's in California wherever it was and we raised a tremendous amount of money uh, we believe a little over uh, $25,000 that's great uh, for guide dogs to do this uh, so we were it, it was an honor a privilege uh, we was blessed to have our general secretary treasurer along with uh, members of the executive council as well uh, out there for this good cause I believe uh, the first one we put on uh, from the comments we're hearing we believe it was a success and, and we're glad to do it you know, our motto is justice on the job, service to the community. How does it make you personally feel to help the community this way? Well, when the community learns of what organized labor does, uh, it does more than just represent members. It represents the collective bargaining agreements. Uh, but it also serves the community in an aspect because our members live in these communities. Our members grew up in these communities. Uh, our members have their children uh, grown up in these communities. Uh, a good example is Lobster uh, 207, uh, where that was a generation of uh, lobstermen that we organized, but it was a generation that was passed down to them, and hopefully the generation that is going to be passed down to their children. Uh, that is one of the sole reasons uh, that we organized them for to be able to keep their heritage intact for their children and their children's after them. That's what we believe as communities are about. That's what we like to forge when we uh, have representation throughout communities and throughout uh, businesses that we represent in our communities. And you can give a shout out to their website for anybody that wants to order that lobster. Uh, please, it's www.lobster207.com. We will ship from the floor to your door uh, within a matter of 24 hours to 48 hours. Uh, all lobster caught, lobster processed, lobster hauled, and hopefully lobster eaten and tell your friends your families and everything about it www.lobster207.com and before i forget we were talking about the golf tournament yesterday it was in memory of one of our members tell us a little bit about wayne campbell uh, you know it'll be hard to joke up uh you see the wayne campbell he was our trustee uh we loved him he recently just passed away so what better honor to uh, have our first one as to have it with Wayne Campbell, our brother. Thank you very much. I think that meant a lot to the members and his family. So we are talking today about the Maine State Council of Machinists. Um, we're bringing the guests in one by one. Um, you can take part in this conversation on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, just hit the comment button on Facebook. You can hit the reply button on Twitter or you can use live chat on YouTube. Um, so we right now um, are going to introduce you to our General Vice President Brian Bryant who has ties to this area. Brian, tell us a little bit about where you started out. Uh, good afternoon, Tony. Thank you. Um, I actually started in the state of Maine. I started at Local Law Just 6, uh, 
when I went to work for Bath Ironworks and initiated into the IM in 1989. Wow. And, and now you're a general vice president with the Machinist Union. What message do you have to all of our members in Maine, um, whether it comes to organizing or just fighting for their rights? Well, the first thing I'd like to say, Tanya, is, is it, one, it was a pleasure coming back home because mm -hmm. this is my home. I lived here for 40 years, and it's always good to get back to the state where I can visit not only what I consider my friends, but they are truly my sisters and brothers uh, in the yeah. labor movement. And so it was good to get back here. Um, you know, the one thing I like to always uh, take back from these state councils, and I hope our members take back from them, is, is we come to these meetings, and I think people realize, our brothers and sisters realize that all of our issues are the same issues. It doesn't matter what industry you come from, um, what sector you come from. We're all struggling. We're all fighting for the same issues, um, and that's for our members to have a better job with better benefits, better pay, better working conditions, and being treated fairly on the job. And now we have free college, too. Correct. We had an excellent, excellent presentation here on the opportunities for our members, uh, uh, dues-paying members, to attend college for absolutely no cost. Great. Um, is there anything that you want people to know about District Lodge 4 and Maine itself? Because the rest of the country may not know a lot about Maine, and you know we're trying to educate them about the industries here. Well, and I, I would I would just say a lot of people when they hear District Four, there's a couple of things that pop up. You know, they they think of shipbuilders, and they obviously because it's made news around the country uh, with the lobstermen. But District Four is a, is as diverse as any of our other districts out there. Um, we represent a number of industries, um, whether it's paralegals, whether it's municipal employees, uh, uh, service service employees. Uh, it's just we run the gamut, um, and you know, the, we're the, just the face of the IM, just like everybody else. Um, we're just out there fighting for our members, and anybody that wants to belong to a union should belong to a union, and they're welcome in the IM. Did you ever think 30 years ago that lobstermen would be selling their own lobster directly to the public? I did not. I would never even fathom that 30 years ago. That's amazing. It is, it is. And, it, and it, they truly, I think the ones that have joined the union, they recognize the value in it. Um, when they came to us uh, a few years ago, you know, their, their industry um, was starting to become go in peril, and, and they needed to come together with a collective voice to fight for their issues, to save their industry. Um, it's, a, it's a delicate industry um, that hinges on them working collectively to sustain it. Uh, and the best way for them, they figured it out, was to join a union. And they joined the right union when they joined the Machinist Union. Yes, they did. Well, anything else you'd like to mention? Um, I'd just like to thank my uh, brothers and sisters uh, back in the shipyard for allowing uh, me the opportunity to bring some of our members of the co uh, Executive Council for a tour of the shipyard this week. Uh, we were able to uh, tour with General Secretary Treasurer Cervantes and mm -hmm. General Vice President Ricky Wallace, and it gave me the opportunity to uh, just show off to them to where I came from, uh, my heritage, but also just to show them the uh, quality work that our members do in building some of the best ships uh, for the United States Navy and protecting not only our democracy here in the United States but defending democracy around the world. That's so true and I think it's so important to actually go and meet the individuals and the members who do that. Yeah, absolutely and it was a great opportunity for them. Um, they, they met a lot of our members and they came away thoroughly impressed with the work that they do. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, appreciate it. Brian Bryant, General Vice President. And we'd like to thank you for watching this episode of Activate Live. Feel free to share your comments on Facebook and Twitter. And we are going to see you on our regular day next Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, right here on the same social media platform. See you then.